Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here, or if you have been here already and you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and set your notifications to all. That way you know every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you are hearing, you can buy me a coffee, or if you want to become a member, all that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. So, this happened about 21 years ago, when I was around 9 years old, but I still vividly remember that very day. I was with my grandmother and her dog, a big black Great Dane. We were walking on the side of a little country road in the middle of the woods. At a 20-minute walk from my house, we used to come here for picking up chestnuts. At a point, the dog went a little further into the woods, and I started to follow him. At the same time, a car arrived on the road and stopped. I looked at my grandma, and she made me a sign to tell me to stay where I was. I saw her talking with the driver. He looked like a middle-aged man. From where I was, I couldn't really exactly see or hear what they were saying, but I heard my grandma raise her voice. I saw the man open his car door. I was sure he was going to grab my grandmother. I was literally so scared. She screamed to me to run into the woods, but a big dark shadow ran into the guy. It was the dog. I think he heard the panic in my grandma's voice and that he understood there was a danger around. The guy got scared and quickly closed the car door and then drove out. I asked my grandmother what happened. She just told me that he was a crazy man and that we should just go home through the woods and stay away from the road. She also told me to stay close to the dog. Thankfully, we got home and didn't see the man again. From this day, we never went picking up chestnuts in this area again, and we also stopped our walking around the house for many years, and we never went walking anywhere else without a dog. I think that's also why I remember this day so precisely, even if I never saw that man again. He let after him like a feeling of danger around our home for a very long time. A few minutes encounter turned into years of pure fear. Fun fact, despite his size, the dog was usually a completely harmless dog who got scared of everything, even cats or chickens. But that day he was the bravest dog on earth. This happened to me 15 years ago, when I was 13, and it still gives me chills to this day. For context, I grew up on a cattle ranch in the middle of the Great Plains in the U.S. Very remote area, and our house was right in the middle of pastures where our cattle lived, about five miles down a gravel road from a two-lane blacktop. The closest neighbor was two miles away, another rancher. The closest gas station, maybe 17 miles. In short, we were a long ways from anywhere, and it's a very independent lifestyle. When live cattle got bought and sold in areas like that, they are transferred by semi-truck with these huge trailers. Some of you may have seen one. Many of the people in that business own their own trucks and operate independently, picking up loads from buyers and sellers as jobs come mainly by word of mouth and relationships. Background checks are non-existent, lots of under-the-table payments, and as such, the community of drivers can be notoriously sketchy. Many are very good just doing their job, but some are big meth abusers, making them unpredictable. The meth abuse typically starts as a side effect to working very long hours, 
and going on long hauls alone so often. This story begins with my parents leaving for the weekend to take my little sister on a trip to Dallas. My dad had a load of cattle coming in from Nebraska scheduled to arrive around midnight, and this was the first time I would be home alone to take in cattle like this by myself. The process is simple. They just back into a load chute and drop off the cattle while the receiver counts them and signs a slip confirming that they all arrived, so I wasn't worried. I had been out and around my dad doing it many times. My dad did give me good instructions, though, to not tell whoever showed up as the trucker that I was there alone, which I believed helped me out a lot later. Anyways... They leave for Dallas, and I wait around until midnight, then started watching up towards the dirt road. I know the guy was supposed to be coming in on, and I don't end up getting a glimpse of his truck lights until 1 a.m. When I finally see him off in the distance on that dirt road, he stops completely and sits there for about half an hour. All I can see is truck lights and trailer lights, and no one comes out there, so I know it's him. When he finally starts moving again, I go out to meet him at the loading chute and help him line his trailer up to back up. This guy steps out once he gets backed up and easily weighs a good 300 pounds. He's one of the dirtiest people I had ever seen. I don't think he's changed his clothes in days and had spilt food and drinks plus cow shit all over them. He started to talk about being late in very random directions, kind of rambling nonsense. No clue what he was trying to say exactly, but he may have been drunk and having a hard time keeping his excuse together. Mentioned a flat tire and also running low on diesel and something about animals on the road and whatever. He eventually asked me how old I was, and I told him. He said, Mighty young to be out here dealing with this shit. You need to be somewhere chasing put. You like put or boys. Don't matter to me none. I like both. And I was thinking, what the fuck? But I told him definitely women. Growing up around a lot of blue collar guys, I wasn't a stranger to raunchy talk, but this was one of the crazier things anyone ever directed towards me. He then went into an absolutely unhinged story about chasing put. When he was young back in Missouri, and the gist of it was he'd been hooking up with a girl he met at a bowling alley for months at one point until one day he went to his family reunion and she was there. Turns out they were second cousins, but that don't bother us none. We kept bucking for another year. I have hardly said a thing, and by this point he'd been talking to me for at least 20 minutes. Once he gave me a gap, I said... Uh, we should probably unload these, and said my mom was back at the house and would probably wonder what was taking so long. He grumbled a bit while still making crazy sexual remarks and comments then, climbed up onto the loading to open his back gate. These cattle trailers are huge and have a lot of different compartments inside them. Putting a few cattle in at a time in bunches, then shutting them in the compartment, making loading them easier and they're also safer on journeys because it prevents them running all over each other. This had 60, 700-pound cattle on there. He let off the first group, and I counted them, and then he got into the trailer and opened up the next compartment and let off that bunch. For the third compartment, he was in there shaking the gate around and grumbling nonsense and then starts yelling out to me that he needs me to come in and help him. I was already very sketched out by being alone near this very perverted dude, but this threw my alarm bells off completely. Never have I once had any trucker ask me or seen anyone else be asked to go into a trailer with them, and this huge dude was clearly just trying to get me in a tight space. I told him I needed to stay outside to count, and then he shook it a bit more and tried to get me to come in there again and said he really, really needed a hand. I told him I'm not getting in the trailer with him, and he needed to figure it out. After a lot more back and forth with this, he finally opened the gate. Those came off and had two more compartments left. He tried the same routine with both of them, 
I just kept saying, no way, man, but I was really freaking out. By the time we finally had all the cattle off, he was in a much less happy mood and started calling me an asshole for not helping him. He tried to next get me to jump into his truck to grab the paper I needed to sign from his glove box and again had to bicker with him about grabbing it himself, as I was not turning my back on this guy. He caved and got the paper. I signed it and told him to head out. I was going home. Ran back over to our house, which is like a hundred yards away, and watched him from the front window sit out there for an hour as I didn't want to go to sleep until he had left. He finally pulled off, and by the time I went to sleep, it was around 4 a.m. What should have been a 20-minute transaction turned into a super creepy attempted rape by some deliverance type trucker, and I am so glad I never got into that trailer with him. This happened my junior year of high school, back when me and my friends were around 16 or 17. I'm a sophomore in college now, so almost three years ago. Oh, and this is my first time ever telling this story. Some background on the story itself, of course. Me and my friends, I'll name them John, Lily, and Luke. John was my S.O. at the time, and Lily and Luke were boyfriend-girlfriend also. So we were a group of two boys and two girls. We all live in Idaho and went to the same high school together. We had this grand idea of all wanting to go camping together. After a few weekends of this not working out and the weather getting colder and colder, we made mandatory plans that we would have to go camping on what could easily be the last somewhat nice weekend there was. So after some decision making, we planned to go up on the road called 8th Street that leads directly into a national forest and spend a night there. John and I had been up there a few weeks ago as an after school adventure and found it to be a pretty cool place. We had even found a nice looking camping spot that we had in mind. So that weekend, I believe we left Saturday afternoon. We gathered up camp supplies, took my Suburban, Luke's Jeep, my dog Bella, and headed to the base of 8th Street. This was a whole adventure in itself, because what starts out as a paved road becomes four-wheel drive terrain about 20 minutes in, which is always just fun. Picking our way over the rocks and large trenches caused by rain, the surrounding wilderness changes drastically too. In about a 45 minute time span, you move from the middle of downtown to the middle of the foothills, sagebrush and grass, to a large pine forest. Idaho is like this. It's very easy to escape the city. Just drive an hour in any direction away from that city and you were basically in the middle of nowhere. We had planned to leave earlier in the day, but since we were unorganized, never on time kids, we left a lot later than expected, meaning we got up to the top of 8th as it was becoming dusk. I'll explain what the location looks like a bit. Basically, going up 8th means exactly that, up, to the top of one of the mountains that looks over the city. We made our way onto what is a dirt road that travels along a pretty wide ridge of a mountain and went to the spot John and I had found earlier. To our dismay, though, we could see cars in a fire there. Someone had taken our spot. So, we continued down the road, farther than John and I had explored the last time we were up there, hoping to find another spot. We were getting a little down because the road seemed to be winding down the other side of the ridge into the forest. We wanted to be on top of the ridge to see the city. Finally, we found a spot. It was perfect. We parked our cars, started a fire, popped some beers, the whole shebang. The spot needs to be described a bit for the story. So picture a tiny hill with the top half shaved off to make a flat area. But the side where the road leads to the top of it is a bit taller, almost like a half crater. This hill was on top of the mountain ridge, and the main road we had been following winded down the base of the hill and continued along. It's obvious the place had been used as a campsite many times before, 
old fire, glass, shotgun shells, you know, the works. Other side note, when you are driving up to the top of the hill, it is very steep, and you can't see that flat area until after your car comes out over the edge of that crater-like hill. Even when you drive the main road around the base of the hill, you can't really see where people are camping. So basically, after you slowly creep up the hill and are brave enough to continue over the ridge, that makes you pretty convinced that you would be driving clear off the side of a cliff, your car rolls over the edge and you see the flat part of the hill. But the sight is not bad after that. Look towards the city and you can see it down the mountain. Look the other way and you can see a big valley of trees and more mountains. So about an hour in, Lily and Luke decide to take a walk and follow the main road some more. I don't know why. To me, this was a crazy idea. John and I were way too scared of the dark to do this. But they being their nature freak selves, they walked off down the road. John and I chill by the fire with the dog for a bit. But slowly, without Luke and Lily, we both got a little spooked. A few times we decided that we should just head down the road and follow our friends. We tried this a few times, but would get spooked and race back up the road, up our little hill and to the site. Once we gave up that idea, we climbed to the top of my Suburban with a blanket. I guess being up there felt safer, so the boogeyman couldn't get to us. Or at least we could see them approaching if they tried. We started to notice that they had been gone a long time, and that the fire was running out of wood. We wanted to wait up for them to get wood with, but it seemed they were not coming back soon, so we decided to work on gathering wood by ourselves. Of course, being idiot kids didn't bring an axe. What we did bring was a hatchet, a rambo knife, and a machete. Odd, I know, but having these things is kind of normal in Idaho. So we gathered those up for chopping wood and for protection, bundled up a bit, and started to head over to the base of a big pine tree. It was then we could hear an engine from somewhere deep in the valley. We could also see headlights way down below. It was quiet, so it was pretty easy to hear. I guess the road that we took is the same road they were on, just much further down. Curious, we watched as they winded up and up, then eventually came into view as they drove under our little hill. Not super odd, although it was pretty late, but whatever. They passed below the hill, and we expected to see them continue along the road. But as they rounded our hill, their brake lights turned on. They turned sharply and began to make their way up our hill on the steep side road. Okay. Um, odd. I guess this is okay, because they couldn't really see us driving along the road. They will drive up and over the little ridge, see us camping, then drive off knowing they drove right into someone's campsite on accident. The truck, a giant white brand new looking ram, rolls over the ridge and its headlights flood the entire campsite. Like deer in headlights, we stare. To our surprise, they move forward a little more so they are pretty much solidly over the ridge. Then they park and the engine dies and the headlights turn off. We are standing just staring at this odd truck that pulled into the campsite. The fire is positioned between us and the car, and they are about 15 feet from the fire and us, about the same distance on the other side of the fire. We must look insane. We have hatchets with hoods on, holding a collection of weapons, staring dumbfounded at this truck. I'm telling you, if I had pulled into that campsite and saw us... I would have floored it the fuck out of there. Meanwhile, my dog Bella, a black and white Springer Spaniel, is going batshit crazy with the new intruders, running around the front of the truck barking and growling and just all out losing it. A person hops out of the driver's seat, a man and a lady hops out of the passenger side a few seconds later. They completely ignore my dog. I mean, she's not huge, only like 45 pounds, but still. I would have at least been weary of a dog acting like that. Without saying a word, they just walk up to our fire and stand there. We still haven't moved. 
The man says hi at this point. He seems overly friendly, talking to us like a good friend, and goes on about how he used to love camping in this exact spot as a kid. Talks about a tree that grew nearby that he remembers being itty bitty. And he asks how we are doing, etc., etc. Small talk. We are weirded out, so our answers are kind of short. We are still trying to figure out what was going on and who this man was. I noticed he was very clean cut, thin, and wearing nice shoes, jeans, and a North Face jacket. He didn't look like he had been camping. I was focused on the man, so I couldn't really describe his wife, if she was even his wife. She didn't say a word. She just sat there. I don't even remember him introducing himself, but a few things he said stand out. At one point, he brings up that he saw two kids down the road a bit and asks us if we know them. We say yes, that they are our friends and they were on a walk. Meanwhile, I'm looking at his truck, expecting to see one of our friends' lifeless hands hanging out of the bed or something. And at another point, I had answered his question about how we were doing by saying we were a little spooked, to which he responds to me with, I have a gun that you could shoot if that would make you feel better. I tell him no thanks. I didn't really want a gun out. Plus, who goes shooting at night? He asks if we have any guns. I tell him no. Right after I say this, I am kicking myself for not saying yes. So now we are just standing here, talking with this random guy by our fire, which is currently dying, by the way. His overly nice demeanor is creeping me out. So I kind of say to them that we need to get going to collect wood. The man then offers us a flashlight that he has in his truck. I tell him we are good. We had headlamps, and we wandered down the hill over to the tree. We are scouting around looking for wood, and I am telling John how absolutely weird this is. John doesn't usually camp, so for all he knows, this is perfectly normal behavior, although he agrees the man kind of scares him. I explain that people never, and I mean never, come up to someone's camp like this. A. It's the middle of the night. B. We are in the middle of the woods, not like a campground. C. It's just plain rude to go to someone's campsite. A lot of the times people go camping is to have peace and quiet. D. This is Idaho. Who in their right mind goes up to some random campsite? Only someone who has a death wish and is willing to risk getting shot by some crazy drunk redneck with a shotgun. He didn't know what we would stumble upon, and finally, E. He came walking up all willy-nilly to two people with knives and a dog, not asking permission or anything. It was just fucking weird. I keep telling John over and over, this is not normal. We finally come back up with a few branches and random sticks and toss a few into the fire. I don't really remember if they said anything else. Nothing of importance because I failed to remember anything specific other than he wished us a good night, got into their truck, reversed down the hill, and continued on their way. Finally, Lily and Luke wander back, and we frantically tell them what had happened. Kind of laughed about it because we were still alive, but we kept saying how weird it was. We asked them if they saw the truck, and they said yes, that he stopped to ask if we were okay. They said yes, that they were just on a walk, and the truck left. We go back to sitting by the fire and go back to enjoying the night. When I hear that damn truck again, coming back down the road the opposite way. I wander to the edge of that hill to watch, and he drives past the road to our campsite. I am kind of relieved. But no. Brake lights again. He stops. This time, he reverses it up our little hill. Great, I was thinking. Now it's easier for him to throw us in his bed after he kills us. Again, the back of the truck rolls over the ridge, down the ledge, and kind of evens out. The truck parks, turns off, and out pops the man. I now notice he has a bunch of branches in the back of his truck. He excitedly announces he had brought us some firewood. Uh... Thanks. 
he proceeds to drag, and I kid you not, an entire tree out of the bed of his truck. With us kind of trying to help, we drag this huge thing next to the fire. We thank him in a not sure kind of way. He again says goodnight, smiles, hops back in and heads down the hill he originally came up. We get here and see his truck move back down the valley till he was gone. We didn't see or hear from him again. We were car camping and I made sure to lock all the doors. I didn't sleep that well. Half expecting to hear the engine of that truck at any moment throughout the night. It was morning. We spent the day wandering, hiking around up there, then headed down late afternoon, with no sign of the truck. I did tell my mom. She was kind of freaked out, and now she doesn't let me go camping without our pistol. We had some ideas. Maybe he was a forest ranger, or maybe someone looking for potential poachers. Maybe an overly friendly good citizen, who knows. But, like I said, he and the whole situation made me feel quite strange. And that isn't how you act when out in the woods. But he never did pull anything, which is what matters the most. So to that odd man in that white truck, whoever you are, please don't ever come near my damn campsite again. Okay, so here I go again. This is one of my earlier creepy encounters. I was probably between 11 to 13 and somewhere around 1995, I think. It must have been the weekend because I was hanging out late with my best friend. One of our favorite things to do at that age was rent movies and pop enormous amounts of popcorn to drench in butter and salt. We nearly always did this at my place. My parents were cooler. We could stay up a little bit later, make more noise, etc. It also helped we could walk to the video store from my house. Imagine my house at one corner end of a street and the video store at the other end, about a seven minute walk. It must not have been super late because we hadn't rented our movies yet, but it was dark in a brightly lit neighborhood. The video store was located at the edge of my neighborhood on a busy street. At that time, this street was known for the fact that it was always lined with sex workers. The women were not usually located near the video store, but sort of congregated further along in each direction. A motel one way and bars in a bowling alley the other way. My mom was always very open with me about dangers, and I was always aware and alert on that street, even though I had never felt unsafe there. It is very populated, but I guess it attracts creeps nonetheless. As we were walking along the street from my house to the video store, a car passes us and pulls over a little bit ahead. I remember it was a dented old hatchback and the color was just orange. We didn't make note of it. It was a residential street and that's where people parked. As we got closer, I did note the passenger window was down. As we passed, the man inside shouted out, Hey! I whipped my head around and could see, vaguely, an older man, maybe 35 to 45, large 70-style glasses and a slightly bald head, maybe gray or light brown, dishwater, disheveled hair. I think he was wearing a dark jean jacket. I remember the buttons, just like jean jacket buttons and a collar. We turned back, kept walking, and ignored him. He pulled ahead and stopped again. At that point, I remember feeling hesitant. We both faltered in our walking, as if the instincts naturally halt our steps. But we did keep going, and this time, as we passed, he said, Hey girls, where are you headed? We did not stop or look and kept walking. I remember my friend saying something quietly along the lines of, what the hell? The man started following slowly alongside us. At some point, he said, You girls look cold. I have no idea if it was cold out. I don't remember that time of year, but I remember those words very clearly. He continued, You know, I could give you a ride. My friend actually responded that time. 
We don't need a ride. He continued to follow us a little ways, speaking to us. I remember, where are you headed? And what are your names? How old are you? Type questions. I don't remember either of us speaking to him again or even looking at him. When we were just about a half block from the video store, we ran the rest of the way. We saw him turn left at the intersection, heading away from the store. We took our time in there. We were flustered and kind of on edge at that point. And I remember telling the kindly proprietor of the video store some guy had been harassing us. We decided to take a different way home, and thank God we did, because he was parked behind the video store. We could see his car at the other end of the lot from our location, running, lights on. It was a one-way parking lot with one row of spaces. We were located at the exit end in an alley, but he was right next to the entrance and I'm sure would have just pulled out the wrong way had we walked that street. He must have seen us anyways because he began backing out. My friend shouted something and started running down the alley. Not to be left behind, I booked it. I'm a very fast runner, so before long, I was ahead of her. I heard her behind me. He's there. I told her to follow me, and I cut through one of the backyards that had no gate. I was shouting at my friend to hurry because we had to get to my house by the time he came out of the other end of that alley, or he might see us going into my yard. Thank God we made it to my house in time. My house fronted the street he would have turned onto, knowing which direction we cut through. It was a corner, and my backyard fence ran alongside the street we were running on at that point. We had one neighbor to the left side of my house and directly next to them, the alley. We cut into my yard through the gate and closed it, but we did not move. The fence was taller than us, but if we walked up my back stairs, he could have seen us. I watched through a very tiny crack between the boards and, sure enough, seconds later, he passes by slowly. As soon as we were sure, he was far away enough, but before he could come around again, we booked it into my house. To cap off the story, I think we were saved by the fact that the alley had several high, sharp speed bumps. If you tried to take those things any faster than a crawl, you would wreck your car. As long as I have been driving, I've loved speed bumps. And I'm not proud of this now, but I never told my mom the whole story. I was afraid she would enforce restrictions on my freedom. I just told her some old guy was hollering at us out of his car. This is when she gave me the fight for your life then and there talk. If anyone ever tries to grab you, fight for your life gouge their eyes, scratch their face, kick them where the sun don't shine. Whatever you can, whatever it takes, never let them get you to another location. I do have to say, I love my mom. This happened about a month ago. And it still comes up in conversation because we genuinely just don't know what happened or was about to happen to us. So, here is my story. It was about 7 p.m. in November, so it was past dark in Metro Detroit. I was driving and my fiancé was riding passenger. We were exiting a pretty populated highway when we turned onto a mile road near the city's shopping mall and outlet centers. Being in close proximity to the mall, it was strange. The boulevard was that empty at that time of night. So we're driving on the deserted westbound side of the boulevard when we noticed there was a stopped, running, vehicle in the middle of the lane. Again, it was dark aside from the street lights that lined the road every 80 yards or so. But their brake lights were obviously lit and we were approaching pretty quickly. My fiancé and I were talking in the car at the time when we both kind of stopped to verbally question what we were both seeing. It was strange behavior, especially since the speed limit is 45 to 55 miles per hour on this road. You don't want to be stopped, especially this close to people exiting the highway. So we slowed down since we're cautious drivers. 
We approached and passed the vehicle in the far left lane, as it was in the middle, and when we were about a car length in front of it, the driver gunned it and started speeding to catch up to us. We never left our left-hand lane, but at this point I was braking because, again, the behavior was off, and we noticed their driving was sporadic. Braking was almost instinctual, as much as it probably wasn't safe to do so. Continuing to drive down this mile road, still no traffic we can see in either direction, we noticed the car was swerving, their car between the middle lane and the left lane, as if trying to initially sideswipe us. Insert red flag here. It wasn't like the driver was intoxicated or texting and just doing a poor job to stay in their lane. This was a driver in total control of their swerving and coming dangerously close to hitting the side of my Jeep going 45 miles per hour. Really bad vibes. Before we knew it, we were blinded by a spotlight coming from the driver's side window into my car via the passenger window. I have 20 tents on my Jeep windows, which usually help control the brightness of the sun. Most mornings and evenings, and even with the tents, this spotlight stunned us, and we couldn't see anything but white. I didn't have time to check my mirrors before slamming on my brakes. Not sure I would have even been able to see into my mirrors after being blinded. I remember my fiancé screaming, What the fuck? We opened our eyes and the driver was yards ahead of us, speeding to get away. I had my fiancé dial 911 immediately. I don't take bullshit, so I started racing down the road to catch up to him for a license plate number. In Michigan, we have Michigan left turn lanes, and I could see the vehicle up ahead turning into one to enter the mall parking lot, which is a huge roundabout. The roundabout speed limit is approximately 25 miles per hour with frequent stop signs and intersections. My fiancé connected with dispatch on the phone as I was trying desperately to catch up to this vehicle. They were blowing every red light and stop sign in sight. Dispatch recommended we do not follow, but I kind of did anyways because I was really upset and committed to grabbing their plate number but from a safe distance and at a safe speed. No way was I going to tell this person when we didn't know if they had a weapon or something. Long story short, this driver knew we were following them and they were speeding through the roundabout, cutting drivers off and blowing intersections when we finally lost sight of them. At this point, the police said the cops in the area were already on their way looking for the vehicle we described and that we should leave it to them. We weren't going to jeopardize our safety and the safety of other drivers just because I was pissed. So we stopped our car chase, but I still crossed an intersection into another shopping center across the street. We saw the driver enter. We figured we could prowl instead of chase in case we saw them again. We never found that car again. Never found out who the driver was, what his motive was, or if the cops found him. We knew it was a male driver because we saw him through his dark side window before he blinded us. White male, dark ball cap. He drove a dark sedan. Looked like a newer Ford Fusion to me. It was a close run-in, and I'm not sure what would have happened if he had successfully crashed into us on that deserted mile road, or if his spotlight had successfully veered my car off the road. We don't think this was a case of road rage, since we didn't do anything to provoke him. To the dude who scared the crap out of us and took away our eyesight while driving a moving vehicle? Fuck you. Oh yeah, quick note. A Michigan left refers to a type of turn where left turns at an intersection are not allowed. Instead, to turn left, you must drive straight or turn right onto the perpendicular road, then make a U-turn at a median crossover. A mile road is part of Michigan's name convention for differentiating common parallel roads in the metro area and facilitating easy navigation of the region, dating back to 1815. 37 of these roads, spaced one mile apart, exist between downtown Detroit and the northern boundary of Macomb County.
most well-known mile road would be the infamous Eight Mile. This happened back on Christmas of 2019, which means that it got dark outside pretty early. I've always enjoyed the dark, and you can say that I'm quite the horror fanatic, so I usually don't get scared that easily. Back then, I was doing robotics after school activity with two of my friends. I don't anymore since the whole quarantine thing happened. I always took the school bus to go home, but it's forced to leave me a little further away from my home because the bus driver needs to go a different way to leave the others, which means that I have to walk three streets to go home. Now, as I said, I enjoy the dark, but in that one particular place, it made me feel extremely uncomfortable. The place being the first road I had to walk. It had only a few lights and it was pretty long. But the thing that made me feel really uncomfortable was the fact that she would barely see any other people. So basically, every time I had to walk down the street, I was kind of alone except for a few times. The day the incident happened, I was about to start walking towards the buses because we were just finished with our lesson. On my way, I was talking to a friend whose name doesn't matter. We were basically talking about what we were going to do in the afternoon. Out of nowhere, I decided to tell him about the street. He seemed to make fun of the fact that it gave me the chills. I laughed too, just because I don't want to start any argument, but at least that's what I remember thinking. It was about 5.10 when the bus started to leave the school. It usually is a one and a half hour ride because of the many kids in it, but I had no problem with that. I just sat and did my thing. I listened to my music, drew on my sketchbook, and had a little chat with some other people in the bus to kill some time. It was 6.30 when I finally arrived to my stop, and as usual, had plenty of walking to do. The area was pretty lighted as always, but when I started walking down the street, it felt like suddenly the power went down or something. As I walked deeper in, I started to lose the light of the area I started from. Now, I know that some of you are probably going to be thinking that if this road bothered me so much, why didn't I tell my parents so they can change the stop or something? I was just too shy to tell anyone, in the fear that they, you know, will make fun of me. I mean, doesn't it sound hilarious? Well, what I experienced didn't make it hilarious at all. As I was walking down, I thought that I saw this old lady coming my way from the distance. I didn't think much about it. When we were too close and about to pass each other, I could see her face even better. I'm pretty sure that she was in her early 70s for sure. She gave me this grumpy mad look. Now, I am used to being polite to other people, no matter how bad they might be. So, by the time I passed her, I had told her good evening. She didn't respond, but she kept staring at me with this mad look. After she walked right past me, though, she mumbled the words, Nebrosehis, which means beware in Greek. For those that speak Greek and understand it, I did my best. I used Google Translate. The story says that word means beware, but Google says it means take care. I just wanted to let you know so you wouldn't come after me in the comments. All right, let's get back to the story. I was a bit disturbed by that, but I tried to ignore it since it could mean anything. I kept walking down the street. As I was walking, I passed this house. It was a sort of an old house that was on the right side of a small road for your car to get in, I guess. But that wasn't just it. In that little road, I saw the outline of a tall person just standing there. I was 100% sure that by that moment I passed him. He kept his eyes on me, but he didn't do anything. He just stood there. After almost being at the end of the street, I felt like I froze when I heard the sound of footsteps from behind me. I tried to have a peek, and there he was. The same outline was right behind me, not moving. But I could understand 
that he was looking directly at me. I kept walking, pretending that I wasn't suspicious. One part of me said that this man was dangerous, but the other one said that he was just walking down the street too. The first part got the best of me. I kept walking while hearing footsteps behind. When I get to the end of the street, I stopped and sighed, as he couldn't see me anymore. I started to now walk faster down the other side of the street. This one had cars, which was a huge relief. When I was finally at the outside of my house, I pressed the doorbell. Usually my parents took a while to open the door, so I'd stayed there and waited. But then, out of the few sounds I could hear down the street, I felt like I could hear the sound of someone running. I didn't think much of it at first, but I started to feel worried when the footsteps came closer and louder. I stood by the door, and then I saw him. The man that I saw on the street was on my home street, springing it down as if he were trying to find someone. I felt my heart drop as I saw a glimpse of him running by. Thankfully, he didn't recognize me because of how fast he was going. By the moment he left, I started pressing the doorbell constantly in a panic, and finally, the door opened. I sprinted inside and told everything to my parents by the moment I went inside. They told me that it was probably just a random man. I haven't told this story to anyone besides my parents since. I've never seen that man again, thankfully. And the last two times I had an after-school class, my father came to take me with his car. It's been five months since the incident, but I don't think I'll ever forget that man sprinting by my house looking for me. When I was 18, I was living with a host family in rural Ecuador. I was there for a gap year and learning the language and doing an internship as part of the program. This was 2013. Every Wednesday, I had Spanish class in the nearby city, and I always came back home before dark. To get home, I would take a bus out of the city for about an hour, and then I would have two choices. One, stop at the tiny town, think one road town, and pay a local informal taxi to drive me the last two miles or two, get off a little later and walk a mile home past my workplace, an animal shelter. One Wednesday, about four months into my time in Ecuador, I was feeling more relaxed and left the city at dusk. I thought about option one of taking the taxi, but I knew from the past that these taxi drivers were often drunk, getting in fights and had a bad reputation with women. I considered walking the first route, but I knew there were aggressive dogs that way, and I felt like I could be a target for a drunk or anyone really along that road. So I stayed on the bus for option two. The problem with option two was that the walk home was unlit on a mostly uninhabited dirt road that no one used, especially at night, which also passed a large empty park. I felt between a rock and a hard place. When I got off the bus and started down the dirt road, I noticed a man walking close behind me. I sped up a little and he matched my pace. I slowed and he did the same. I was hoping I was just being paranoid, so I decided to stop to check something in my pocket to let him pass so that I could walk behind him. When I did that, he came level with me and stopped to face me and I knew it was bad. He greeted me, and I started walking again without answering, and he walked with me. I was thinking hard then. I am a planner in many parts of my life, and I had before thought that if I ever had come back late, I would take root too, and if I had issues, I could stop at the animal shelter. It's the only building along the way, where there was a 24-hour guard because we had desirable exotic animals there too. I knew the guards from the daytime and I thought if they weren't taking an on-duty nap, I could get some help. So as this guy is walking with me, I knew we are about a quarter mile from the entrance of the shelter. 
The guy started asking questions like how old I was, if I lived alone, if anyone was expecting me that night. All obviously creepy questions and no questions like my name, where I was from. I am a tall blonde girl who obviously was not from Ecuador. Or how I spoke Spanish. This was all in Spanish, even though it obviously is not my first language. I was exaggerating about all the people waiting for me at home and trying to seem calm and friendly to try to get to the shelter entrance without him realizing that I was nervous. When we got to the entrance, I stopped and told him that I wanted to see a friend and to continue on. He told me he would wait for me and I told him no and to go on. He continued walking but almost immediately left the road and veered into the dark park. I could see him silhouetted against the starry sky at the top of a slight hill in the park, just standing. I could feel he was watching. Meanwhile, I started knocking on the gate, like we do at work, to let the guard know that someone known was there. I was hoping, beyond hope, that he wasn't sleeping. Luckily, the guard was awake and came to the gate. He immediately let me in and knew something was wrong. I told him what had happened, and he was clearly freaked out, but didn't want me to see that so much. He asked if I wanted to wait or walk, and I said walk, because I wanted to go home, and he said he would walk home with me the remaining half a mile. By that point, the man was gone from the hill and disappeared into the dark. The guard I was with had a flashlight, a police-type baton, and some other things and looked tough. We start walking, and the guard is using the flashlight. We turn a corner, and the light beam hits a red pickup truck parked by the road. All of a sudden, a man jumps from a bush by the truck into the back. The truck starts, and it drives away super fast. The guard and I were shocked. Of course, we assumed it was the same guy, and that this was a setup. The guard walked me home, and I called my program mentor that night. At the time, I was fully shaken and knew I would never return after dark again. But looking back with a bit more wisdom, I realized that that was a really, really close call. The next day, the guard told all of my coworkers what happened, and they were super protective of me from then on. I strongly believe that they understood far better than me the danger I had been in and was, potentially still in, and shielded me a bit. Later that week, we heard that two girls had been raped and murdered in the park. My program encouraged me not to share the story to help protect the image of my host community. But I see clearly that they were scared to death what lashback they would get. I loved Ecuador, and I went on to live and work multiple years there. Still, one of the closest life or death experiences I have ever had. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. I would like to take a moment and acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Matt Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Tammy Slayton, Colt Stonewall, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Samantha McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for continuing to support the channel, for without you, there would be no me or this channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.